from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Well, hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report where we count down the top 10 things that make us go wow. Woo! In a moment, James St. James, editor of the Wow Report. And of course, here's our chief creative officer, Tom Campbell. So let's get on with the countdown number 10. Number 10. Have you guys seen Top Gun Maverick? I have not. I, uh... James, have you? I don't, I never even saw the first one. I have no interest in seeing the second one. It's universally applauded, loved by gays, straights, LGBTQ pluses. And can I just tell you, you know, I hate to be a contrarian, but they're all wrong. <laughs> um, I, I succumbed. It's my sister is visiting me from the East Coast. It's not her fault, but I'm looking for things to do with my sister. I thought, let's go to the movies. Let's go see Top Gun. It must be what a video game is like, right? If there's a lot, you, know, you can't help but get caught up in it because you're shooting things. But isn't it just military propaganda? Isn't that like- 100%, but it's white guy military propaganda. Okay. Here's the one line up front because Tom Cruise, who looks really good in a confusing way, um, um, is this, he's still Maverick. He's still a captain after 35 years. He didn't get promoted because he's a renegade, but he's done all this great service. And they're about to like, shut down his program and shut down his jet and the bureaucracy the pentagon can't be trusted and he said and, and he like steals a plane and you know does all these things this is the beginning of the movie this is the, this is, this is the opening and he's yeah, like, yeah, the, first, the first three minutes <laughs> and he's like someone says they're they want me to retire but not today <laughs> so it's that idea of like we want to kill the white supremacy but not today, because you can't trust the government, you can't trust the Pentagon, you can't trust the senior officers. It's one white guy, one angry white guy with a gun, oops, I mean a top gun, needs to go and make it right for everybody. Now, the the and he goes on to teach, train this like elite squad of top gun people, you know, and they've been updated. There's women, there's blacks, there's an Hispanic, but in the, I don't wanna say the laziest way, but in the safest way you can include others in a, in a white man's story, because they're there, we put them there, but they have no significant role in the entire thing. Now, one of the stories is Anthony Anderson's um, character had a son, I think with Meg Ryan, you know, in the original one anyway, he now is one of, he, he's, he's now one of the fighters and there's a back history. But wouldn't it have been interesting, instead if it was his white son, if it had been his daughter, or if, and there's a fee, there are female flighters. What if one was gay? None of this can happen in a Top Gun universe, but it would have made it really interesting. And, and then there's this one black officer who works with John Hamm. John Hamm is just there to say, no, you're wrong. You're bad. So black and white. So incredibly like paint by the numbers. But there's this one black officer who stands next to him, who's a wonderful actor, can't remember his name in a second. And his job is when Tom Cruise finally decides to sort of steal the plane again and go off the mission again and save the world again, one angry white man with the top gun. He's like, he, he it's the white savior thing where he's like, go do it, Maverick. Go do it. Save the world, white man. It's really embarrassing. You know, but the, of course, this kind of stuff courses with homoeroticism and phallicism off the leash, right? Even though they never say gay and there, and there was no kind of, Gay well, yeah, but what, yeah, why is it that the gays like this so much? I know there was the volleyball scene in the first one that we've all seen, but what isn't is it? Nostalgia? It, it, isn't it nostalgia for, for beloved IP from yesteryear? They said it's it's doing well with 35 plus. It's doing it's breaking all the records in the world, but it's you know, it's it's the movie that's bringing back old people. Um, and and that's part of its success. But um, and there isn't a homoerotic, you know, thing on the beach with a couple of girls in it. Um and it is nostalgia and, you know, but it, it um, and the, the one good thing about it is that Jennifer Connelly plays Tom Cruise's love interest and she is age appropriate. They've been an age appropriate, you know. I'll be damned. We love her. She's in Snowpiercer and she is the reason to watch Snowpiercer. Yes. She's so good. Big but, um, Jennifer Connelly fans here. And, and, and the only reason to see it in the theater and, the, and really the bonus was 
you know, I was on an AMC theater. You know how AMC has the Nicole Kidman back in the movies thing? Sparkly silver pantsuit, yes. Yes, he's walking up into the theater. And Heartache like, feels good in a place like this. Yes, and, and, and she she has the light, the projector light behind her head, making her an angel. And she's like, you know, welcome back to the theater. Well, it cuts from that after, by the way, after 45 minutes of trailers. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't been to a real theater a long Don't time. Don't get me started. Followed by Tom Cruise's face. Hello. Welcome back to the theater. We made Top Gun just for I you. Just, I am just sick of the pandemic self-congratulation sort of. Because I went to the movies too and had exactly the same thing. Back to, like, you'd think they'd invented the cure for coronavirus. It's like... I, 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 well, I think, you know, Van, Nicole Kidman was just on the cover of Vanity Fair this month, and I thought she should have been wearing the sparkly silver pantsuit. I think it is the most iconic thing she's ever won. I think she should wear it in every movie from now on. I just, I love it so much. You should lock the look. All right. Well, this seems to be a bit of a movie special because uh, Top Gun is playing in theaters everywhere, blah, blah, blah. And let's move on to our next one, number nine. Number nine. Movies, movies, movies. Well, you say that Top Gun is bringing it back for the old folks. i am really got a movie that's really for the old folks here. I went to see Downton Abbey, A New Era, at the theater <laughs> in Florida with my stepmother, who is a super fan. She watches it how you watch Golden Girls, Fenton. She watches it every single night to decompress. And, you know, E just had that giant, like, uh, five-day marathon, 24 hours a day of Downton. So I did that. So I was all caught up. So I know everything. You can you can quiz me about Downton afterwards. Um, this one is actually really fun. The last oh. one, the last movie was terrible. Yes. This one. This one, Julian Fellows is back on his game. And you can tell maybe after the how miserable he was writing about Americans in the Gilded Age that now he's back in his wheelhouse. And it's, the writing is crisp. The story is fun. Um, it starts with Lady Grantham, uh, you know, Maggie Smith, and she gathers the family together for an announcement. And she says that she has recently come into the possession of a small villa in the south of France. And it's... The, the backstory is 70 years ago, she met a man and they spent a week together and then he gives her this villa. And there's all sorts of mystery of involved in how and why, but it's all just an excuse to get the Crawleys to go to the south of France. And uh, it's, you know, Brits out of water. It's very, you know, funny, funny, ha, ha, ha. And meanwhile, um, Lady Mary is in charge of the, you know, the manor. And she has a silent movie come and film it at Downton Abbey while they're all in the south of France. And the servants, of course, are over the moon because they get to meet the, the silent movie stars. Well, there's one actress who's very elegant and beautiful, and she comes in. And, of course, the minute she opens her mouth, it's like, she talks like, you know, it's like the um, singing in the rain. Uh, thing. Big man. Big yes. man. <laughs> and so halfway through, they decide to make it into a talkie. And what are they going to do? Because she can't talk. And oh, my course, God. Lady, Lady Mary. Mary. Lady Finally. Mary comes in and dubs for her. Yes. But... The great thing about it is, you know, Barrow, I don't know if you remember the evil dastardly butler, the gay, the butler, gay one. Yes. Who's always in the back, you know, in behind, underneath the staircase plotting something. Well, he finally gets his happily ever after one of the silent movie stars and they fall madly in love and he gets his happily ever after. And I was sobbing at the end. I was crying. My stepmother was crying. There's um, something happens. Okay, don't give everything away. Don't give yeah, everything away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something happens that you see coming from the first scene. And when it happens, I mean, the whole audience is sobbing and applauding. And I'm oh, just, no, just, Lady Grantham's going to die. I can't say whether that's true or not. Oh, my I God. I will tell you terrible. afterwards. Is Can I ask you, is this the end of Downton Abbey, or could there be more? There something happens and there cannot be more but i have a they set it up where there's a new generation of children and you could possibly flash forward 10 or 15 years and have another generation oh and they will let me just ask you cuz this we have determined on previous broadcasts I want to keep this very clean that this is the year of the penis a full frontal nudity is downton abbey delivering us any full frontal nudity they're all naked. They all go to a nude beach. Lady Grantham is like just doing the splits on the beach. It's disgusting. And I almost walked out. <laughs> Townsend Abbey, a new era, same old story, isn't it as now? 
<laughs> Number eight. Number eight. Oh, I got a visual prop for those. Oh. Number oh. eight. Last night. Well, not last oh, night. You went to the oh. I went to the premiere of Jurassic World Dominion um, at Man's Chinese Theatre, which was hilariously introduced by the uh, MC as Jurassic Domain, <laughs> which is <laughs> an interesting twist. Uh, my friend Jazz Tangay at uh, Variety invited Nolan to, oh, to go. I was going to ask. I was hoping no one got to go. It was just a plus one. And I was like, out of my way. <laughs> so, oh, no. I said, Couldn't there be another plus one, please? So I twisted her arm ever so gently. And very, <laughs> she managed to get me on for the ride as well. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I mean, the Jurassic, the, the, this is definitely. Yeah, this is cannot be the end of the franchise, but this is definitely the best entry in the franchise in a long time. And I have a feeling it will eclipse Top Gun in at uh, the movie theaters. I think it's going to be absolutely massive. Which dinosaur will come up number one, Jurassic Park or Tom Cruise? But, oh, well, or I love what you, <laughs> you said that, that Tom Cruise is really good in a confusing way. I, I just want to double back on that very quickly. What What did you mean by that? Which dinosaur will... You said Tom Cruise looked good in a confusing way. Oh, oh, um, because you wonder how much of it's real. Well, uh, when, okay. he, when he does his message to the audience, it's a different looking Tom Cruise because it's like they shot two years ago. And you just wonder how much of it is fine, is, is auto-tuned. That's all. Well, in this case, in the case of Jurassic World, the dinosaurs are real. You've never seen more real dinosaurs. There's no uncanny valley. There's no weird sort of, this is CGI. They feel and look and act mm -hmm. so real. And what they've also done, I think rather brilliantly, and I'm sure Spielberg is sort of the author of this initially, but they've tuned it to a fine art, is making the dinosaurs anthropomorphic, just slightly human. In remember in a touchstone of the Jurassic is the Velociraptor going in and wrapping its claws, talons on the tabletop. Do you remember that? It's a great moment because they got three like nasty claws and it's walking into this kitchen and it goes trap, trap, trap. You know, these little ways that they make them. It's so weird. I look at my dogs, uh, Agnes and Dorothy, and they look like Velociraptors. They just made them so cute, even though they're killers. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. The yeah. other thing about this is, it, as a re, you know, I guess as maybe it's a, a formula of the blockbuster is that you reference all the other previous episodes and you reprise all the memes and all the little jokes. And the, so Jeff Goldblum steals the entire movie just by dint of a couple of lines here and there, you know? Love him. Uh, I'm not going to give the story away. Um, every dinosaur has a star turn. They, they face jeopardy, death by the humans, that is, face death, you know, at the hands of a T-Rex, of this, a Megalodon, or this, or that, every dinosaur you've ever seen. Um, and they have this brilliant thing with uh, locusts. There's a plague of locusts, but not just locusts. Dinosaur locusts. Jurassic, like they're massive locusts. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. The other really good thing is Campbell Scott, who does this new, Scott. this new emerging genre, I think, trend alert, of sociopathic villains. Remember Mark Rylance in Don't Look Up? Kind of like bumbling and super cold. Not Masters of Evil have always been, I'm evil, and, but sort of deadpan. Sort of now, now they're the Trump administration. I was just going to say that it's sort of Trumpian where it's like they've sort of bumbled into evil. They're not bumbly though. They're just like deadpan. There's nothing there. And he does this marvelously kind of, he just sort of, He's sort of not. He's on some sort of spectrum, so that he'll just start delivering a line. Oh, they're all they're, all they're all yeah. Elon Musk's is what they are. Neurodivergent, yes, yes. very musky. Yeah. Um, what else can I tell you? Well, here, wait a minute. My, my big question, though, is hmm. you know we've sort of canceled Chris Pratt at this point on the internet. I don't know if you've been aware of this because um, he's sort of a, like weirdo, evangelical, religious, anti-gay, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But is he fabulous in this enough to to get yeah, him uncanceled? He's, he's nice enough on the eyes. I, I think he sort of suffers from an absolute of personality. In well, that's just, it doesn't matter whether he's good or bad or you, we he's hate him or not. 
but he's it, just it's there interesting and the rest of the film carries him. Jeff Goldblum is beloved. Yeah. He is, it's so bizarre. He kind of is the franchise. And, and Laura Tom, Dern. Mm, Laura Dern, yeah, yeah. Everyone loves Laura Dern and Dallas Bryce Howard. But still, I think it's all about Jeff Goldblum. He gives the best lines. It's all that life will find a way. And when you think about it, the entire franchise is premised on the same idea. We're going to keep dinosaurs in a park and then shit happens because you can't keep dinosaurs in a park because human systems always fail, chaos. And that 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 is as good for the first movie as it's good for every single subsequent ever movie. I want to pitch a movie where a bunch of people colonize to Mars, but, acts, but they get Jurassic Park dust on them and so dinosaurs it's planet of the dinosaurs what do you think jurassic park i, I buy it i have what i can go one bit better let's do jurassic drag race and it's drag queens versus dinosaurs <laughs> lady bunny <laughs> bianca i'm not even going to touch that that is going to get me into so much trouble <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of a cheesy ending to the movie this idea that dinosaurs and man and nature could all live together but you know that's not going to happen um what else can i tell you oh tom do you remember november 2020 when we went back to shoot season two of drag race uk after the the long eight month break yes you were at pinewood yes did you ever wander around i didn't because i stayed home for the re i i i work oh, that's right i work remotely from my den because there was sort of, you know, for lunch break, could wander around, and we were on the set, the abandoned set of Jurassic World Dominion, and I took some pictures, we'll post them on the wire report, but I was like, oh my God, I recognize this scene. I was there. Cool. And it's just so funny how today when you shoot a movie, it, you're in this lush jungle in the movie, but on the set, it's a couple of sprigs of bush. And you're like, this doesn't look like anything. This looks a bit like low rent. I mean, really, it was like, I mean, it was kind of great to be there, but anyway, you'll see from the pictures. Um, oh, and the last thing is the villain this time is that the, it's not so much about a theme park. It's that a science organization is doing research on them to better mankind, but there's a villain, blah, blah, blah. But the HQ is, I wondered if this was intentional. It must've been, is like the Apple headquarters. It's a circular, a circular building. So anyway, okay, that's it. Uh, Jurassic World uh, Dominion playing in theaters everywhere. You're listening to our Board on Radio, Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and James and Blake. Uh, we're getting down to top the things that made us go wow. Number seven. Number seven. I want to talk about the completion of season two of Hacks. James, have you watched any of Hacks yet? No, I'll oh. do it this weekend. I promise. Thank you, James. You may leave the. You may leave the <laughs> um, Spencer, are you up to speed on Hacks? I certainly am. I texted you in my excitement the yes. other day after watching the finale because I thought you were a little bit. Mm -mm -mm. No, I, you know, others that we work with were going up and down about hacks. I thought the first two episodes were an amazing, we talked about it at the end of the first two episodes, was an amazing um, com completion and, and resetting of, of, of the board from last season to this season. There was one episode where they go on the road, Laurie Metcalf is the lesbian, onic kind of tour guide, which was a little, you know, it's, you know, every sitcom has kind of its like on the road thing, but I thought it redeemed itself without going into plot points. I just love every all the actors. I love all the actors. I, you know, Gene Smart is so amazing. Um, uh, uh, Hannah Einbinder is just so believable. They have an incredible relationship. I read an article that says that it's really, it's really a romance between the two of them. It's really about, you know, which which is what makes the ending kind of so especially heartbreaking. It feels like the, it feels like two seasons. I'm sure there's more seasons in them. But it feels like if this ended, it is the end of an incredible rom-com. You know, it's like it's really beautifully and poetically put together. And I love the way this show incorporates it being Pride. We can tell it's all the time. Like Pride's different for us. How it so beautifully um, incorporates LGBTQ plus characters in a way that does not seem forced does not seem ex you know it just it's all kind of organic and. I recently got to encounter in person the incredible Megan Stalter, 
who plays the assistant, the crazy girl, you know, from TikTok, and you know what I'm talking about. Oh, the, the assistant. Yeah, I love her. She's so funny. She is hilarious. They give her more to do this season. Yeah. And, 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 and then, you know, because she was discovered on TikTok. She was discovered during the I pandemic. Know. And I thought maybe she's a one trick pony. She's so good. And they, and they play dimensions with her and her role gets richer. And it just makes me so happy because I feel like there is, not that I ever doubted it, but it was confirmation there is a career, a comedic career, a long journey for this woman. And uh, I'm so excited by all of that. Hannah Einbinder's really good too, don't you think? She really kind of, uh, without, it's a, it must I be really hard. I saying that name. That's my favorite name to say in Hollywood, right? Yeah. Hannah Einbinder. Ray Newman's daughter, I never really can't say that enough, but she is, she has that role that could be the annoying, you know, Gen Y or, you know, I don't know which Gen Z or that could be really annoying and really trite. And she brings such humanity to it. Yeah. And, and she's bisexual. There's her, her sexual encounters are so accurate because they don't make you feel dirty afterwards, but they're never, they're kind of like hot followed by, there's an amazing moment where she, I'm going to spoil one plot line where she had to lease her, she got a condo right before she got blackballed and had to work, you know, in Vegas. And so she's, she's leased it. She goes to get something and she ends up having this hot affair, this awkward encounter followed by a hot night of sex with her subletter. And in the morning, she's like at home, but he's decorated really nice. She's like, oh, I'm so happy. Here they have. And um, and she um, she wants to stay. And he's like, you got you to gotta go. You, what, what are you doing here? And I, I, I don't even know. I, by the way, I don't even know the sexual. I don't even know the gender of the person she slept with. I keep saying he, but it's, it's it should be they. Sure. I think, but but yeah, that was heartbreaking. And I cried at the end, I, like at the end of the season. And with you, it's like, it could be the end. I hope and pray it's not because I just need more of it. Yeah. I mean, there's different ways to tell the story. Happens, sometimes when that happens, when you have like a the perfect ending and they keep going, it ruins it because they should have, and you, you look back and you say, well, it should have ended there. And then it just sort of turns into like, we're just pleasing the crowds now. We're just, you know, which yeah. is sort of well, what so happens. Far, I show. have incredible faith in the creative team that make that show. Yeah. Um, so I, I wish them all the best. And I, I was, fully fully um into season two of hacks hacks is streaming on hbo max james you gotta i mean enough already. i don't know i promise i will i was this last week i was crazed and so i didn't have a chance to watch much of anything but mm -hmm. yes yeah. what have you got for us at number six number six number six i was crazed and again didn't get a chance to watch much of anything last time um, I was, as I mentioned, I was in Florida and I was visiting my father who is now 87 and he's in an assisted living home. And um, I go down and I like to go down with it with a tape recorder and let him tell stories because he has a million stories that I've heard a thousand times growing up in my life. But I just want to get them all on on tape because he, you know, he tells these stories about his father and his grandfather and his great grandfather. And it's just all the family history. And I just want to sort of get it down there. Well, I was going through some boxes back at the house of family genealogy things and family photos and family you know, just things. And I came across this book of genealogy that my great grandmother, my great grandmother Wiley had put together. And she was born a Whitford. And so she traced the Whitfords back to 12th century Scotland to uh, a bishop named um, William Whitford, who uh, one time was on the pulpit and he said some scandalous things about Charles II and the entire town took up arms and tried to kill him and raced him and chased him out of town. And I thought that was so funny because all up and down the family tree, people, townspeople are always chasing the family out, out of towns and it's happened to me. So <laughs> I am keeping the tradition alive. It happened to me, you know, 1996. Uh, there was also a really funny thing. Um, there was a newspaper article in the Raleigh News in 1930s, and it was a great, great Aunt Myrtle, okay, who grew up in a, in the White House in Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, okay. That she she was a you know she grew, her father was the lighthouse keeper, and the article goes on to this is upon her marriage. They're writing this story, and they're saying that she had many, many beaux, all of whom you know proposed to her, but she was waiting for this one special man. She met him, and he finally proposed to her, and he wasn't a rich man, but she said yes. And on their wedding day, 
he rowed across the bay he, he in his rowboat to pick her up and they took her and he took her off and then the the last line is um Upon return from their honeymoon, the lighthouse keeper's daughter will begin her life of lighthouse keeping. <laughs> <laughs> Punsters. Yeah, and you realize that they, they probably had that that last line and writ the whole article around that last line. So I that was very funny. They may um, have been waiting her whole life for her to get married to use that. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? The lighthouse keeper could do some lighthouse keeping. <laughs> Did you get a don't say gay vibe in Florida? What was it like? Oh, uh, well, that's just the weirdest thing. It's, you know, the, the, the thing is about Florida is that it, it is a southern state. And the great thing about southerners are that as long as you don't talk religion or politics, they're the most wonderful people in the world. And everybody says hello, and everybody, oh, you look, oh, that is such a cute little shirt. Where did you get it, Bubba? And everybody has small talk, and it's great. But the underlying thing is that everybody is all in for DeSantis there. Everybody is a Ron De, Governor DeSantis super fan. So he's been doing the right things to get Floridians on his side. And it's such a different vibe. Also, the COVID thing is bananas because they get mad at you if you wear a mask. I was at CVS. I wasn't wearing a mask. And the cashier coughed on me. <coughs> <coughs> Like I almost, I I almost, I I gave a little girly scream. I was like, ah! <laughs> and you can get out, out of town in the, in yeah. the great family tradition. But I, you know, I mean, I had a wonderful time, and everybody there is wonderful. And that's the thing about the South is they all might be seething sociopaths <laughs> and who are out to destroy our our rights. But they're the most. But otherwise, they're really great people. <laughs> you know. All right. Well, thank you for that update from Florida. Number five. Number five. If you don't have enough dinosaurs, you've got to watch Prehistoric Planet, which is on, oh my gosh. Yes, it's on Apple Plus. Apple Plus, made by the BBC, hosted by David Attenborough, the, the sine qua non of natural history programs. He's about, he's sort of dinosaur age himself, bless him. But Wait, still extra points for, for use of sin and hunk I don't think you've That's ever you, I don't think we've ever had that on our show before. Good for you. Squid pro quo. It's like <laughs> <laughs> but prehistoric planet is a five-part one-hour docs in which it's it's a natural history documentary about the dinosaurs. And and it's really all about the CGI. And the CGI is really good. And I've only watched one of the episodes, which is Coasts, but the very first scene you see. Tyrannosaurus Rex footprints in the sand and they go down to the ocean, these footprints, and you're like, that's odd. What's a Tyrannosaurus Rex doing on the beach? Turns out they used to go swimming and they would swim from island to island with their little baby Tyrannosaurus Rexes, which are so cute. They're about this high and they go beep, 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 beep. And you know, you're like, oh, it's such a cute thing that would grow into a like 20 foot monster that would just eat you for breakfast but um so you the, 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 swim the, with those little tiny paw hands yes, the there. little paw legs and the big tail going swish swish, swish. oh there you go like an alligator sure yes and that's how they would go from island to island um the other every sort of vignette teaches you something extraordinary um for example the chiragannosaur which is a sort of underwater lizard thing they would migrate tens of thousands of miles to find this particular kind of smooth rock that they would then swallow to as ballast to keep them underwater. Can you imagine that being a dinosaur and you have to swallow rocks so that you stay in the water as opposed to floating too much? And then the rocks also in your stomach help to grind up the food that they ate. Isn't that sure, amazing? Sure. The other third amazing thing I learned is you know, remember those Jane, it's one of your favorite movies, the Ammonites. Ammonites? The Ammonites. They're that spiral sort of seashell type thing. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was that, the Ammonite Woman, or what's that movie? You oh, know? yes, with Kate Winslet, the, the lesbian drama. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, these Ammonites, back in the day, in, in the... They Jurassic... were huge! They were dinosaur Ammonites! Yes, and for one <laughs> night only, they would light up. They would be they would be like bioluminescent. Not only that, 
This was the night that they would mate. And the way they picked their mate is they would light up and then sequence lights. Boop, 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 boop. Oh God, and they would they find the mate by finding the person who could perfectly sync their lighting show. Would you think that the um uh what's the Richard Dreyfus um uh, movie with the with the aliens? Close Encounters. <laughs> yeah. Close Encounters. Do you think the Close Encounters were actually looking for the bioluminescent people? Maybe that, they were, that was... and they found us instead. Yeah. Yes. And so they these perfect. It's like Studio Fifty Four. Everyone's going to Studio Fifty Four. They're all lighting up and going do 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 do, and they all have to find their match. It just and then they oh, die like a bunch of Simons, like a bunch of the game yes. Simon. And they have and an amazing night, and the next day they die. This is the thing, they no longer exist, is that correct? That's correct, they're all false. And yet they figured this out. How do you figure this out? Well, I don't know, but it's all true. Because it's David well, Andrew. Now, wait there you go. Fake news, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> That's they're able to deduce amazing things from the fossil record, you know? And it's really great. So I recommend that. Prehistoric oh, Planet. Let me try it. On Apple Plus. Ooh la la. Head over to the WOW Report to meet the Queens of Drag Race France. Hosted by Nikki Doll. Uh, with judges Daphne Berkey, Kitty Smile. Drag Race France premieres on WOW Presents Plus June 25th. And if you're listening in France, it's on France.tv. Which is pretty cool. Drag All our fans in France, I mm -hmm. bid you bonjour. Wee wee wee. You're listening to our Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report on Radio Andy Fenson here with James and Tom and Blake. We are counting down the top ten things that made us go wow. We've reached number four. Number four. I love that for you on oh, Showtime. Yeah. Now, it's the perfect show for me because it is set at a home shopping network. Thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> it comes <laughs> full circle for Tom. Exactly. You know when you don't like, um, I watched that Lakers show on HBO Max. I know nothing about basketball and I find it fascinating. And people who know basketball are like, Ugh, it's so inaccurate. Well, I'm watching my expertise, home shopping. And 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 they, they have the essence of it. It stars Vanessa Bayer from Saturday Night Live. And here's the premise, I'm not giving anything away. She, it starts off that she's a kid who's suffered from leukemia, it's in the past. She used to watch home shopping for an escape. She bought a bracelet from a host, Molly Shannon, years ago. And now all these years later, she's well, she has enough, she's going nowhere in her life. She worked at the Costco, her parents have over protect her because of her child leukemia. She goes, she's on a random dare kind of thing. She goes and auditions to be a host on this home shopping network and she gets the job but she starts to fumble and fail in the first episode. And the head of the whole thing, Jennifer Lewis, as an executive lady, and Jennifer Lewis is always, everyone's, I mean, come on, Molly Shannon, Jennifer Lewis, Vanessa Meyer, what's not to love, right? All right. Um, uh, Jennifer Lewis says, who are you and what are you selling? By the way, you know, I know you know from QVC, David Venable, Fenton, the guy. Yes, love David, oh my gosh, <laughs> yes, mouthgasm. The man with the mouthgasm. Yes, he tastes food in the kitchen with David. And Jono Wilson plays him, basically. They, they have totally taken archetypes from uh, all their kind of thing. He's like, my mama's recipe, this is delicious. Um, <laughs> but she, he, um, Jennifer Lewis confronts Vanessa with like, who are you? You don't have a point of view. Everybody here has a point of view and they all like do their like kind of persona. And so she says, she's about to get fired. She says, I have leukemia. And they're like, oh my God, that works so well. And so she starts <laughs> selling through the roof. So she has a secret the whole season. I'm not through the entire season yet that she is, you know, it's kind of like younger where the woman pretended she was, a, you know, in her twenties and she's in her forties. So she has this secret. She feels torn about it. Um, and uh, wait, isn't the there a very famous, isn't there a very famous Carol Lombard movie where she becomes success, a successful on TV person uh, because she says that she's dying. And so, she, but she really isn't. I don't know it. It's, it's it's like to have and to have not or something like that is it's a Carol Lombard movie. Okay. It sounds like this is sort of based on that. Yes. But it it um it's a little bit of an undisciplined show. I feel like it's still finding its feet. And I was kind of I couldn't talk about it after the first one because I was kind of disappointed. I didn't want to say bad things, but I keep going back to it. I keep watching it. Um Matt Rogers, uh, who is a really funny gay guy, he does like the on he did on Quibi. Remember Quibi? They did the um 
the gay show, the game show. Um, oh, yeah. He's a very funny, uh, yeah. his incredible actor, Paul James, who plays her love interest. Now, I don't know if this will ring a bell with you, James, but do you remember an actress from the 70s named Bess Armstrong? I love Bess Armstrong. Oh, my God. She plays uh, Vanessa Byer's mother. So I just like, I remember Vanessa, she was gonna, she was gonna be like a sitcom superstar. And she was on many sitcoms, but she never landed in that one role that made her rich and, and famous. Yeah, I have very specific memories of Bess. I love her so much. In fact, I feel like she was on something in the 2000s that I really liked too. Um, I looked her up yeah, and she's I worked her, her entire career. She's a working actress. She's the real yes. deal. But never, you know, at, at one time in the 70s, I thought she would be like, you know, uh, uh, a Jill Clayburg. Yes, yes. So anyway, there's there's a, a, a lot to unpack. It um it's worth watching. Uh, I love that for you on Showtime. Of uh, you know, there's complaints that Molly Shannon's kind of playing Molly Shannon, but I'll take that any day. Yeah, no, please, Betty Davis time. played Betty Davis for forty years. Exactly. Um, and I saw you know we, I read Molly Shannon's uh, biography, which we talked about autobiography memoir, <clears> but. I, I saw recently on social media that her daughter graduated from college. I had no idea that Molly Shannon was married. Oh, yeah, yeah. Has two daughters, I think, two children, and one just graduated high school or something. And it just, it flipped my mind because I, I still think of Molly Shannon as this oddball single girl, you know, uh, going to comedy gigs in the 90s in, in <laughs> spaces. But, you know, I guess I'm the only one who hasn't grown up. Everyone else has. Okay, thank you very much. Number three, James. Number three. It is Pride Month, of course, and I have two tea stories that I want to share with you. Uh, the first is a very happy one. Very con um, Congratulations to the uh, Carolina Panthers, who just hired the fir NFL's first trans cheerleader named Justine Simone Lindsay. And Justine is a gorgeous black a uh, trans woman who just posted something on Instagram of her in her little cheerleader outfit and saying, I cannot wait to show you all what this girl has in store for you. And it's real. I think I might have to start watching football this year just to, to show my support for Justine. Um, on a sadder note, do you remember a couple weeks ago I was telling you about G General Hospital and there's a trans character on there and she was in the just starting a love story with this yes. real life wounded warrior who uh, they had a real sort of meet cute and they were just starting to get sparks and fall in love. Well, they've dropped the storyline very suddenly, very mysteriously out of the blue. The character, the, the warrior, the um, army character who, you know, is missing his legs. Uh, says I got a job in another town and it's too good to pass up and they have tears and they and he leaves the show. Well, he went on to Instagram and he said he's not he's he's not he's moving from California. He's taking his family to Illinois so he can spend more quality time with his family and that's all he's going to say about it. Well, you've got to think to yourself there are and the, the, the show isn't saying anything. They've just moved on. They pretended like it never happened. And once again, the trans character is in Siberia and has no plot line, nothing to do whatsoever, except, you know, whatever. You've got to think either they weren't the, the powers that be. The producers were said that they maybe the actors didn't like each other, or weren't getting along. Maybe he the, the producers were getting like backlash from like the evangelicals or the, the you know, the conservative people who watch soap operas and they stopped it. Or maybe he was getting backlash from online media. I mean, you don't know what happened, but it was very pow. The storyline is over. We are not going to do this anymore. And like I said, it was so adorable and they had so much chemistry and it was such a groundbreaking story that they just dropped. The investigation continues, James St. James. You yeah. need to get with this. Yeah. But like I said, you know, the C Cassandra James, who is the, who is the trans, she plays um, Terry on the show, the head of the general hospital. She's still on it. She's just fantastic. She's absolutely wonderful. So, I mean, you can continue watching for Terry, but it's, it's very sad that her, her big love affair fizzled in the matter of two weeks. Well, if it, if it fell apart for circumstances beyond their control, maybe they'll come up with another organic storyline. To... Yeah, I mean, on a positive, I mean, it could be that uh, Chris Van Etten, who plays the the wounded warrior, that maybe like he has to go back and take care of a family member or something. I mean, we just don't know, but right. it, it does invite all sorts of, you know, 
I just looked up Cassandra. She's beautiful. She's such an innocent ingenue. She's lovely. Yeah, she's very much like a young Terry Hatcher, she reminds me of. Yes. Well, keep watching General Hospital, right, James? What network yeah. is it on? It's on Please. Channel 7, ABC. 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 All right. Number two. Sky Scraposaurus. The improbably <laughs> lame. I, I sense you are a dinosaur obsessed right now. Number two. Well, I was just sticking with a theme. It's really got F all to do with dinosaurs, other than the fact that you could say skyscrapers are the dinosaurs of our age. Now, hmm. how would you say that, Vincent? I want you to explore that a little more. <laughs> They're really big. <laughs> That's all you got. <laughs> and if we don't return to the office, they're kind of extinct. Well, <laughs> speaking of the office, here's what happened. So I have a little Google setting. So I check in on what's going on in the world of skyscrapers. And, you know, the Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world, but it was going to be upstaged by the Kingdom Tower in Jeddah. But here's Where is the Jeddah? on that. Um, in Saudi Arabia, right? Oh, gotcha. And okay. um, the MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, arrested Boo! the bin Laden family who've been building it. So it's just sitting there incomplete. Meanwhile, he has just announced they're going to build a new skyscraper. And what's so interesting about this skyscraper is that it's tall, like 500 meters, but it's going to be... <clears throat> 170 kilometers long. So imagine, if you will, it took me a while to get my head around this, a line of skyscrapers all in a row, and it's going to go from the Red Sea for 170 kilometers inland. How and the whole 170 idea, kilometers? Yeah. Um, well, it's, <clears throat> is it like 60 imagine, miles or something? something can like you that. imagine living way back in the building and having to go to the front of the Red Sea to get your mail? It gets worse. <laughs> there are going to be no roads, no cars, no carbon emissions. And the whole the whole vibe of this neon city, of the city in neon. And I was like, what the F is neon? It's owned by the royal family. Mohammed bin Salman owns everything. But it's it's an area in the north northwest of Saudi Arabia. And it's a green thing. They they first got attention because they were get, announced a plan to plant 100 million trees. So they're busy doing that. And now they're going to build this city that is 170 kilometers long, 500 meters high. And it's going to be one long, it's called the line. It's not Give me, a, give me a, a, a visual though of how 500 meters high. Is that like Empire State Building? Is it like, is it smaller than that? Larger than, what do you think that is? It's sort of around that height. And so it goes 60 miles, that Empire State Building high, but you can't use a car to get around? How do you get from one end to the other? They're going to use Hyperloops and high-tech escalators. Oh, and well, that's, that and made, that's fascinating. And everything is going to be within five minutes walk. Um, wow, 500 wow. meters is like a third of a mile. That's kind of tall, right? It's tall. Yeah. What does it say when presumably oil-rich Arab nations are investing in green technology. Oh, we are. The word. They know something that we don't. But it's a little bit paradoxical because even though the whole idea of this is green, you know, construction is one of the ungreenest things you can do. Yeah. And building this enormous city, because that's basically what it will be, it's, you know, I mean, concrete is incredibly ungreen. It releases a lot of carbon emissions and things. And the tractors and all of that stuff, they aren't using green tractors. I know that. Right. And it's basically fossil fuel. Basically, concrete is made up of the shells of, you know. Well, my question is, what are, are people going to be living in it? Is it businesses? Is it everything? Idea, right? it's yes, it's going to be this, this huge green city that is like building... Um, uh, the, what is it? Building with nature instead of over it, or something? Or something. it sounds yeah. almost being a young person I am, but it sounds like a biodome, right? Like you can't, as as temperatures continue to rise, you can't live outside. Yeah. You create this city that presumably will be self. Energy, like, but, but by the same energy. token, it's also building castles on sand, which seems inherently a bad idea to have an entire city built in something as unstable a region as sand dunes. Well, the other problem with it, I'll tell you this is because, uh, 
you know, you're reading something and then you see a link to a book. And I, so I bought the book and the book is called, uh, what is it called? Super Tall. And it's all about the history of skyscrapers. Absolutely fascinating. It's by Stefan Al. And in Super Tall, he talks a lot about concrete. <laughs> but the thing is, concrete decays. Even mm. the Burj Khalifa is only designed to last for 100 years. Um, especially reinforced yeah. concrete, because you put iron bars in the middle of the concrete. But they inevitably, moisture gets in, and so the iron starts to rust, and it expands, and it cracks the concrete. I mean, is this kind of crazy? And I would imagine in extreme heat, it would probably even exacerbate that. Yeah. So... So who knows what will happen, but that's the latest on the skyscrapersaurus front. Oh, there's another great word I learned. Actually, I'll just leave you with this, that, that they call them progress traps, which is that mankind cannot help building amazing things or doing amazing things, but it's a fallacy sometimes in that what we build or create is a progress trap. And he's sort of arguing that a skyscraper is kind of a progress trap. Yes, we can build really high and that's great and amazing, but ultimately you know like the people on the easter island they built all those statues which are amazing but they had to cut down all the trees on the island to do it and in so doing they destroyed their environment and wiped themselves out and that's the idea of a progress trap and so that's the ending yeah exactly that's what we need let's take a break and when we come back reveal the number one thing this week that made us go wow you're listening to world of wonders wow report things that make us go wow Welcome back to the Wow Report. Uh, just before we reveal the number one thing this week that made us go, Wow, Vanjie, 24 Hours of Love, now streaming on Wow Presents Plus, presented by House of Love Cocktails and Mocktails, giving you Vanjie as you've never seen her before. 24 hours, 18 suitors. Will she find true love? It is a great dating show that happens like that. Yes, Special guests, is. Got Mick, Violet Chachki, Derek Barry, and more. And so new episodes every Thursday on Wow Presents Plus. Right, it's time for the number one thing this week that made us go wow. Number one. Uh, there was a breaking news story this week uh, saying that Texas State Representative Brian Slayton, a, a Republican, of course, um, has announced that he will file legislation to ban drag shows in the presence of minors. Because, as you know, there have been a lot of, you know, teen uh, teen drag shows and teen or uh, even book readings for little kids that, you know, readings for little kids. This is yeah. Tasha Davis does like an imagination station kind of. Book yes, but but, yeah. I, but there have been a lot of pictures that have been going viral of a young child putting a dollar sign. I mean, putting dollars in the jock strap of a drag queen or something, you know. And the the Republicans are making this their cause du jour. Drag in the presence of minors is you know going to destroy the world. And um, you know this this is in Texas where we are just two weeks away from one of the biggest tragedies involving guns and minors that have ever happened in this country. And this is what they decide to make their cause. Their and cause or their is action. this a distraction? Is Exactly. Is this a distraction? And unfortunately, what the ripple effect might be of this is, first of all, you can see other, you know, states taking, doing the same thing. I can see Florida, I can see, you know, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, everybody jumping on board with this and deciding that drag queens are the scourge of, and you can't have drag queens and minors and blah, 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 blah. And minors doing drag is just, you know, how dare the parents. It, some people are saying that this is an excuse to shut down pride parades because you can't, they will say it's the same thing, minors, drag queens, you cannot have minors in the presence of drag queens, blah, 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 blah. And it's just, it's a terrifying rabbit hole to go down. Fenton, what do you thought? think? It's terrible because the news has been such lately. I sort of just sort of try to avoid it. And after years of banging on, on Facebook about Trump this, Trump that, I just feel this, all this is just an extension of this awful, toxic, evil mindset that far from disappearing seems to be sort of just Gathering gradually steam. advancing. Yeah. The Republican Party does such an amazing, relentless, soulless job of hitting people's sort of touch points of fear. And yeah. this is that aren't based in logic, that aren't based in science, that aren't based in experience, 
but rile up. Well, that ain't right. That's wrong. Them, them fighting words. And yeah. it's, it's really depressing. And, and we, while we can't ignore it and, you know, here we are, we are currently shooting the 15th season of RuPaul's Drag Race and, you know, have won awards and have all these amazing things are happening. And yet it's hard. We're in the bubble and all that, but I do not take for granted that what we have right now is going to stay. Yeah. It's like, it, it's all precious and we have to fight, be willing to fight for it and, 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 and explain our stories one at a time to the people we know and love to try to convince them not to vote against our human rights. Um, and but, you know, uh, but Tom, by, by the right. same token, I think it's so important, you know, like we say, we are all exhausted and they just seem to be gathering more and more momentum. Mm -hmm. And the, the last thing we should do is, is be, get that, you know, fatigue. And Oh fatigue. no, absolutely right. And I, I wonder if there's a helpful analogy or not, but I sometimes see it as a, as a virus or as a sort of epidem epidemic. And we got to figure out if we figure out ways we can fight disease, that's how we should approach yep. this. Because it's not necessarily yeah. about us being right. It's about combating an infection or a delusion. An or... epidemic of fear and ignorance. Mm. Yeah. You know, and the fear is about and nothing, but it's part, and I always say there's nothing more powerful than telling your story to the people you know, to the people mm. that you relate. I'm saying like one on one, like if you know a gay person, it's hard to hate a gay person or an LGBTQ yeah. yep. person. Right. And the, and, the, and the education thing, again, the Republicans, not by chance, have been dismantling public education for years, you know, because I think a dumb electorate is an easily led, or I shouldn't say dumb, but uneducated, you know, and, and education is about realizing about worlds outside yourself, experiences outside your immediate experiences. Right. Um, I, I get if you're from a straight community, you have straight parents, you go to straight school, straight, 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 it seems odd to you, or the binary seems like, well, I've been raised the binary, why? Do I have to question the binary? Because, you know, the idea is to learn about the world in its entirety and, and the big and the small and I don't know. And and don't and, and the way that the Republicans have usurped falsely, have false idols, Christianity, like they're the Christian party. Bullshit. Republican agenda, Republican platform does not equal the teachings of Jesus. Sorry, period. Yeah, it does not. You're so right. It's a weird paradox, isn't it? Because in the media age that we live in, I think the whole strength of it and the potential is to show you the other and to show you the full variety of human existence. People you might never meet, you can like get in contact with remotely via TV and, you know, you can see things you can't see. We can see dinosaurs in the Jurassic Age. Amazing. <laughs> but the other side of it is it promotes a kind of tribalism and a sense of like us versus everything else. And I think that's the thing to not give into, right? Right. Amen. 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 Well, I love you, Tom. I love you, James and Blake. Thank you so much for listening this week. And happy Pride, everybody. And um, same time, same place next week. Until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow.